Welcome to Let's Talk Geek, episode 131, your dose for everything geeky. In the show with me today, I've got Tim Hawk. Greetings. Johan Els. Good afternoon. The Mixer. Hello, hello. And me, Jan Vermeulen. Tim, we haven't done this in a while. What manner of geek are you? Networking, web, programming, PHP, backend, DB. <laughs> generally a lot of server side uh, and web side of things. Johan? Uh, broadcasting, engineering, that sort of stuff. The Mixer, you have a name, don't you? I'm still on Johan. <laughs> <laughs> your name's Johan. <laughs> and, what, did uh, your parents hate you? <laughs> post-production, pre-production, post-production, video studios, broadcasting, <laughs> uplinks. Uh, just tell me when you're ready. Um, <laughs> okay, you can shut up now. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes, hi, I'm Annie. Uh, I'm a space and sci-fi geek, <laughs> photography geek, and I don't have a pretty strap line yet, so. Hint well, it says toxic bunny. Yes, it says. That's pretty awesome. She's just toxic. <laughs> I'm a telecommunications and gadgetry geek. I write for my broadband at ZA, so I get to deal a lot with that kind of thing. It's actually, it's actually pretty cool. keeps my days interesting. So from me, you'll be hearing a lot about what's happening in broadband in South Africa, uh, wireless technologies, um, what's happening in, with smartphones, that sort of thing. Specifically geared towards South Africa, which is pretty cool that I get to focus on what's happening in our country. The show today... Is, is recorded on the 8th of May, 2013, in case you were wondering. And uh, in the show, we're going to be talking about the Finn Fisher spyware in South Africa. Circumventing region locking in South Africa is illegal. Who knew? What? Circumventing region locking of content in South Africa is illegal. And what's interesting is the type of illegal it is. Save it for the... I'll sh I'll I, so I have cool. a question about that. It's so cool. And it's so bad, it's cool. Let me put it that way. And then three years of solar activity in three minutes. You can catch our uh, you can catch us on IRC right now irc.ltnet.tv that works irc.letstalknetwork.tv does not work does it work again http.irc.letstalknetwork.tv will works work. again first rule right. of television is don't tell them what's broken <laughs> <laughs> Never. Just keep going. Yes. But, well, this isn't about television. This is about getting people into IRC yes, right so now. Tell them rc.ltv.tv. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We've got a random for the show. Uh, Johan, you found something interesting. STS-131. Commander L. Poindexter. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, Poindexter. Poindexter. Let STS-131 mission to International Space Station aboard Space Shuttle Discovery. This was mission 131. Okay. What was funny about this? The mission featured three spacewalks performed by, I'm not going to even try, somebody and Anderson. The replacement on, uh, they replaced an ammonia tank assembly, retrieved the Japanese experiment from the station's exterior. <laughs> I'm trying to, yeah, that sounds normal. <laughs> yeah. And switched out the uh, rate gyro assembly on the S0 element of the station's truss. Okay, but I just thought the piece retrieved a Japanese experiment from the station's exterior. If it was experiment, wasn't that wasn't that uh, uh, yeah, experiment? <laughs> that would have been funny. Um, I've also got a random. Um, Mary Sophie Germain was born in on April first, April Fool, seventeen seventy six, and lived until June twenty seventh, eighteen thirty one. She was a French mathematician, physicist, and philosopher. Despite initial opposition from her parents and difficulties presented by a sexist society, <laughs> she gained education from books in her father's library, from correspondence with famous mathematicians such as Lagrange, Legendre, and Gauss. And can, can I just – so what you're saying is the female mathematician was an April 1st joke. <laughs> no. Sorry. In fact, she did groundbreaking work on Fermat's last theorem. Oh, very cool. And she has a prime named after her. A Sophie Germain prime is a prime P such that 2P plus 1 is also prime. And 131 is a Sophie Germain prime. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. Thanks, Wolfram Alpha. <laughs> With that, we're going to go straight into the quick geek. First up, a mini drone gives UK soldiers a visual advantage in battle zones. Annie, you came across this one? Yeah, I just thought it was uh, pretty awesome. That is a mini drone. It that is, is a very, mini. very mini drone um, that the uh, British troops are using in Afghanistan. If you're, if you're listening to us on audio right now, um, go and check out the show notes. Um, those of us who are watching the video, you'll be able to see the small drone. Have you ever seen, it's sort of the size of those micro helicopters that you can now buy. Yes. 
um, but it seems to be a lot more stable. Um, and they also they they send it into they control it from smart devices oh, and then no, they send it around corners and into buildings and just to give them sort of an aerial advantage. And because it's so small, it's hard to shoot down. So what's the battery life? I don't know. You don't. You need two minutes. Twenty minutes of flight time. Two hours of charging. You need two minutes. Yeah, I just I just know with the other I play with this little helicopters. It's never mind twenty. Five minutes of flight time. <laughs> no. no, you need. That's all you need. Don't think about it. Because they're using it in a combat situation. So that thing's going to hover around for 20 minutes. It's too late. <laughs> you just want to look around the corner, check out your heart position, whatever, come back, and then we go. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to move us along. Echinoid spherical homes. Annie, you also spotted this one. That sounds interesting. What is this? Yeah, so the Echinoid spherical home is a, a new conceptual design by a firm. I can't remember where they're from. It must um, be Switzerland. Sounds Swedish. <laughs> I don't think so. But uh, <laughs> basically, they're trying to build low-cost housing. So what they're looking for is um, the design is based around the most volume, house volume, you can get for the least amount of material. Based in Cornwall, UK. Yes. Yeah. And uh, English, so this, course, is, this is the design they've come up with. Um, it's built on stilts because so then it, in low, you know, low-lying areas, it, um, they're safe from flooding. And this, the little helical stairway is also supposed to be used as a hydroponics garden. Um, so it can be self-sustaining. You put a whole bunch of them together. And uh, when I first looked at this, I thought it was very interesting. And the more I thought about it, the more I looked at their designs, the more it bugged me. Because while I understand that you are b giving them the most volume that they can get for a house using the least amount of materials, it's just... The amount of space it takes up, it physically takes up, you could, you know, you're losing space. You can't transport circles as easily as you can transport squares or rectangles. I, there's just lots of little things about this that, that bug me. But so it's, What is the design decision behind the sphere? Why don't they just make it a cube? Because it's the least amount of material. So the, let's say your material is expensive. You can yeah. now produce a higher volume. Now the question is, how much of that is usable volume? Because that's actually where the problem really if, comes. If in. you can shove stuff in the top and bottoms, which is useless volume, that yeah, but still, that is that section where you end up getting close to your sur to your surface. Yes, or to your ground level. That's that's wasted space. You yeah. can't shove stuff. In. No, no, but, well, but, but I mean, like you could just for water storage, HVAC or water, w or water, and then that's your geysers or whatever can go there. I think oh. stuff stuff that takes up space that you don't want to see. Kind of okay, thing. That's, that's yeah. So if you look at the cross section, you'll see it's meant to be a sort of um, two floors, three floor kind of design. But I don't know. Like I, on a daily basis, I, I vary between liking it and hating it and deciding it's a great idea or it's a bad idea. Um, so and they've got some prototypes. Apparently, it's very easy to construct um, and you can make it out of clay, all kinds of things like that. So, so I just thought it was it was an interesting project. I must say, when you said the helical uh, stairs could be used for something, I, my first thought was a, uh, what's it, Pythagorean screw? The thing for pulling water up? Archimedes I thought, screw. Archimedes screw. That's the, that actually worked quite well. We've well, got a better <laughs> idea out of the RC. Come on. Okay. What's RC? What's RC saying? Stairway and a slide. Cool. <laughs> Excellent. <clears throat> Can I add something quickly to Quick Geek that I meant to add that I totally forgot about? Yes. A trailer got released today for Ender's Game, which is finally actually going to be coming out in August. I am so excited about this. Uh, they have Harrison Ford for Groff. Wow. If you've read the books, you know who Groff is, the overseer. Um, and I think Harrison Ford, he's like going, going, he's like, oh, this is Harrison Ford. He's like, okay, I'm going to go watch this movie. But um, if you haven't read the Ender's Game, does he get punched? No, it's kids. Harrison Ford a movie with Harrison Ford he's not a nice guy but he doesn't get punched in he, just he is Gra Graf is actually quite a manipulative the, nasty I, guy I watch Harrison Ford to watch him get punched it's great anyway but <laughs> but, but go and if you haven't read the great. book definitely read the book it's very easy reading um, say again what was the book called Ender's Game by Orson Scott Card go. Orson Scott Card don't go for any of these others till you've read that one that that is a really really good book and some of these other ones are odd <laughs> All right. New Brazilian Antarctic based design contest winners announced. Annie, you also found this one. You're going to be talking to me a lot tonight. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> we love you too. You've got to make up for all the stuff you didn't speak. Uh, exactly. Uh, well, okay. So, um, what happened was last year, 2012, the original Brazilian Antarctic base burnt down in a fire. Um, Hold on. It was, uh, you might have remembered seeing it in the, in the news. There was an overflow in the uh, fuel tank oh, okay. um, system. There was a bad fire. Two people lost their lives. 
So they, they came up with a design contest for people to submit new designs for um, the, the next version of the Brazilian Antarctic base. It's got a very long name that I can't remember. And they have now chosen the winners. And the winners are... Um, it should say there. Um, it does not say here who the winners are. I will go to the IAB website and take a look. <laughs> look, go to the other one. Okay. The design firm. That, that's a company. Anyway, so... E-Studio 41. Yes, E-Studio 41. Uh, and they are uh, Portuguese. Start, okay, yes. This whole thing is in Portuguese. Yes. Go Chrome. Translate it. And uh, so this is the, sub the design that they submitted. Um, and I thought it was quite beautiful. Um, you should go check out the site. In, the link is in the show notes. And then you can see what the cross sections like. And, you know, the whole rationale between how they laid out the base why they've got, you know, higher and lower levels, the, the different segments. Very, very interesting. So, so this is the new base that's going to be built. Cool. Um, and obviously they've made very serious provisioning that the same type of fire won't happen again. I should hope so. <laughs> that would be the first thing that goes in my design document. NASA compacts three years of solar activity into a three-minute video. I love NASA. They do all kinds of interesting stuff. <laughs> this is awesome. So um, this is actually pretty cool. And he also spotted this. But just to run you down through what it shows you, um, in the first uh, 30 seconds, it's got a partial eclipse by the moon. From there, it's got a roll maneuver. Um, then it goes into the largest solar flare recorded on the 9th of August, 2011. Then uh, Comet Lovejoy is this passing by the sun. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Uh, another roll maneuver. Then... Transit of Venus on the 5th of June, 2012. And then finally, another partial lunar eclipse to end it all off. From where was this all shot? From It was uh, all shot from the NASA Solar Dynamics Observatory satellite, STO. Um, in a previous show, we actually spoke about the launch of the new STO satellite. Um, this is from the first STO satellite that was launched. Is that it, a tries to maintain a it tries to maintain a, a, a fixed distance from the sun at all times. But if you watch the, the video, you'll see that the sun does get a little bit you know, bigger and smaller. Okay, so that, that satellite's not sitting in a, a geo-orbit or anything. It's actually static. Yes. Well, it, it's, it's face pointed at the sun the whole time. That's okay. its focus. It's, it's, it's just it's solar dynamics. It's our solar observatory. So, and it's really awesome. Three years' worth of, uh, of, of activity in, in three minutes. It's very nice. It's very cool. Cool. Then I'm just going to give this a quick mention, but I think we should move this down into the What Geekery is this segment of the show. But um, I, we discovered some time ago, actually, but we only ran the story today, that paid for international video streaming is illegal in South Africa. That means that if you pay for Netflix or Hulu um, by circumventing the normal region restrictions associated with those services, uh, you are, in fact... Um, still breaking the law. Um, but I'm going to leave it at that. We're going to give it the attention it deserves in the What Geekery is the segment of the show. And that's not Geekery. That's just bull, but let's keep going. <laughs> and, and move on to Nox gear. <coughs> Fiber optic athletic gear for high visibility at night. Um, and this is a Kickstarter. We can't have a Let's Look Geek show without a Kickstarter, and this, this is one of them. Um, Annie, you spotted this one as well. Yes, so I've been very busy online the last two weeks. Um, this is what happens <coughs> when we don't have a show. Yeah, uh, um, the rest of us have been working. Sorry, no, I'm <laughs> joking. Um, Nox Gear have, it was a Kickstarter. It unfortunately closed four days ago, or I would totally have bought it. Um, it's high-vis sports gear, but it's made with fiber optic. So the, the light panels that, that you see going over the shoulders... Um, is fiber optic cabling basically mm -hmm. and then you've, they've got two different models the one is a static model for like if you want to play ultimate frisbee at night and stuff like that and you want to be able to differentiate between teams you can buy a red one or a blue one or a green one or a yellow one and um, then a glowing frisbee as well yes you get I have one of those a light up frisbee I'm sorry um, and then you can then they have a, a tracer 360 model which is the one we're looking at now which actually flickers between different colors for advanced visibility. And that's if, for guys if I who buy the second the one, can I make it go to one static color and then change depending on what I want? Yes. It's got, they've got a variety of different color sequences and okay, uh, cool. modes that you, can, that you can choose from. And so I'm very sad that I missed this Kickstarter because I totally want one of these to wear on my motorbike. Um, and so I'm waiting for them to open their online shop. But they okay, but they did raise the money they were looking for, so oh, yes, the product no, is proceeding. No, way, way more than what they needed. They were one of those overachieving Kickstarters. Okay, so. that's wonderful. Yeah, very cool. 
Then something else that's been bugging me. So it's been a very, a very busy two news weeks, actually. And so it was very difficult for me to decide which stories to put in. Sorry, to Sageway during the quick geek. Many apologies. But WASPs, those are wireless application service providers, can still access your cell phone bill directly. And only Vodacom has double opt-in. So what this means is a, a WASP is like these guys who try to con you. And I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it bluntly into subscribing uh, to these services that send you ringtones or pictures or whatever every day. Sometimes they don't even con you. Two rand a day, five rand a day. Say again. Sometimes they don't even con you. They just sign you up and then. That's okay. So no, 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 that that's not a con. That's Uh. what we call a rogue wasp. So conning you is saying, hey, do you want free ringtones? You know, uh, subscribe to our service. And then like little down here at the bottom is a little star that goes subscriptions two rand a day. Um, That's a con. Um, what, what Annie is talking about is a rogue wasp and that's these guys they, they can honestly do it and then the own, they can just bill you two rand a day even though you've not signed up and then basically the, the, the onus comes on you to complain about it enough that the wasp then has to produce proof that you signed up but uh, th- that takes so long and they just keep billing you in that period um, so what's happened, is, what's happened is Vodacom has actually implemented a double opt-in system. So what that means is that you say, yes, uh, I would like to subscribe to this WASP. Then Vodacom sends you another SMS to go, are you sure? Then you say, yes, then you're subscribed. So otherwise the WASP cannot bill you. End of discussion. Well, they it's a system called the Mesh. charge. Yes. The system is called Mesh. Um, it should also be noted that not just anyone can bill you. There have to be a WASP that's registered to WASPA. The, the WASP mm. Association. But be that as it may, there seems to be massive problems at WASPA. So well, what now happens in, in this particular case is that um, Vodacom has actually seen a 33% decline in WASP registrations after they implement the double opt-in. People don't want this mm. is what it comes down to, right? This is, and that's just the beginning of the proof. Now, the one WASP that's got into headlines quite a lot is Bongiorno. And the reason being is that they've received a lot of fines. And so you can actually go onto the WASPA website and see how many fines are against Bongiorno. And they just don't seem to be paying them. And then we discovered from industry sources and the like, all Bongiorno, Bongiorno's discovered all they need to do to not pay the fines is appeal. Then they don't have to pay the fine. They can keep going on merrily. And only until the appeal is resolved, which can take up to 12 months, do they have to then pay the fine. So as things stand right now, <coughs> no fines against Bonjourno are outstanding, according to Waspa and Bonjourno. Waspa has confirmed it. Sounds so like lucky e- even, even though there's a lot of, you know, it looks like there's a lot of outstanding fines, those are all under appeal, apparently. And um, Waspa said that the appeals aren't as straightforward as people might want them to seem because it actually gets to the whole legal process of how Waspa administers these these fines and or, or at least handles the complaints is what it sounds like so yeah until then unless you're on Vodacom with the double opt-in system all you can do about this is complain and hopefully get your money back but uh, most people or, or a lot of people I know have just abandoned their numbers to try and get away from stuff like this it's ridiculous you need a way to say just opt me out in the meantime yes and so this is a question we ask of all the operators and no one gives us a straight up answer why don't you have a system that lets me say, do not sign me up for any WASP ever, ever. I don't want WASPs on my, to be able to build my account ever. And, um, and apparently, and this is interesting, somebody in the comments section of my broadband actually posted that um, the, the Vodacom actually lets you edit your WASP subscriptions in their online portal. Very interesting. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So there's that. I should go just yeah. confirm that. My understanding that I have none is correct. Yeah. <laughs> um, then a VDSL, there are some v- VDSL rollout concerns. And, and to be clear, what's happening is the MSANs and the ISAMs, the, the, those are, that's the physical hardware that's going to be replacing exchanges eventually. That's giving us access to this glorious 20 and 40 megabit per second um, DSL goodness. They are still being rolled out. So they're still being deployed. But the issue is the commissioning. Apparently, there's a soft switch problem that is um, causing massive delays in the commissioning of these MSANs. When you say soft switch, what do you mean by soft switch? I mean, switch? it's a switch, but it's a piece of software. Is okay, w- where, where is the switch? I have no idea. So I don't know where the problem oh, is. Saying, is. Is this it something is they're going to have to go and replace? Because I, re- I read your article, and that's what it sounded like. It's almost like, well, okay, this piece isn't working, so once they've sorted that out, they're going to go through and replace 
this piece. But, but it might be a software update. It might be, it might be a software problem, yeah. But good that they're still rolling out because that means literally once that's sorted, you're going to have this massive online Switch on. go. Do. <laughs> it's going to be great. Uh, yeah, the, so it's just sort of like a, a bit of a warning. You know, if, if you were excited about VDSL, um, just give it a couple of months because, uh, and I mean, technical glitches are to be expected when you're rolling out something. Uh, that, that's part of the thing as well. Telcom explained to me when they were, when they first announced the, the, um, the VDSL project and the, the reason they're able to do it now is they found equipment um, made by two different manufacturers that lets them do what they need to, support their legacy systems and roll out new VDSL stuff. So uh, there were always going to be niggles and yeah. hopefully they no, sort it out sooner rather than later. As long as it's moving forward. Yes. Which and it it's not, like it is. not one of these, we'll, we'll get to it, we promise next month, it's just as long as it gets done <laughs> and forward. Movement. Exactly. Good. Then something that Johan feels very passionate about. Reload, the game saves savior by a South African company yeah. is on kickstarter is it actually a south african company because i know one of the guys was south african but sorry the, sorry the, the, the guy is south african yes. um you can tell by the video completely yeah. i think it's a south african company as well and they are located in the u.s but um well they registered as via the u.s because they signed up before kickstarter was made available to all locations yeah um cool. but there are south african kickstarters that must have been a long time ago it was it was quite a while ago so no i mean it must have been like years ago no before Kickstarter was only open to international things <coughs> recently. Okay. Um, be that as it may, it's only open for four more days. So if you want this thing, start pledging. They, they're not, uh, they have not, they're only at $1,300 out of their 5,000 goal. They said it's picked up a lot the last couple of days, but there are only four days left. So if we want to get this, to, if we want them to hit the goal, everybody needs to please go pledge. Okay. Can a, you just give a background? What is it about? Reload. We've talked about this before, but just Johan, for you, Hunter. No. <laughs> Very simple Windows-based application that you can take your saved games out of any game and put them onto the cloud. So the next time you format your machine, they run a database that, that knows where games generally <coughs> save themselves. Can and I get one of these for my Android <laughs> that I don't need to unlock my Android to use? That would be awesome, yes. Yeah. Sorry, I, this is awesome because… I just wish I could. This is every time. And the nice thing about this one is they've also they've built in some automation or some schedules. So you don't have to remember to do your backups. You can actually play your games and, and it actually detects when you leave the game. It actually it saves the files up to the cloud. So the next time you by accident format your machine or it goes lost or stolen, you're not spending a lot of hours just to get you back where you were. Because another thing, I mean, why do all these games are played online? Why aren't they saving your with the I, I don't know. So, luckily, they don't. Because I wouldn't know which cloud they're going to use. No, they, they which this one. Mm. Which cloud are they going to use? Dropbox. Amazon cloud. You can use anything. Oh, you can choose. You, you pick can your choose own whether cloud you want to use Google Drive. You can choose whether you want to use Dropbox. Whether it's on your which is, sorry, personal let, rig. Let, the last time I sorry, I haven't installed it lately. Uh, the last time I looked at it, all it was doing is just picking up. You've got Google Drive installed, and then offering that it will actually save it into your Google Drive sync folder. So Neat. it's not talking straight into your. Dropbox or whatever, it's just making sure that those games are being saved there. But it zips them together or compresses them together into sequences, and you can roll back your saved games. Definitely, if you go play games, any games, look at it. And, mm. and it's not expensive. Um, I have uh, put in twenty-five dollars or thirty dollars, mm -hmm. and uh, if they make the Kickstarter, if they make their funding limit, then I will get access to three copies of Reload oh, that's for bad. life. So that's, that's totally good. worth it. Yeah. Yeah, that brings us to the end of the Quick Geek. Next up is events, so stick around. F so for the events, we've got stardates.co.za for all your geek event needs. Please, if you've got anything, let us know. Mm. A lot of things happen there. Stardates at Let's Talk. Somewhere in August and this game is starting. <laughs> <laughs> like that. Yo, let me know. We'll put it on the calendar for you. <laughs> you can just email stardates at let's talk network TV, right? Yeah. So that'll get through to us. So something interesting that Annie's picked up on uh, is this first Lego League, which we mentioned a bit earlier. And uh, the Society of Automation, Instrumentation, Measurement and Control have sponsored Sorry. an exhibition. I'm not going to say it three times <laughs> fast. <laughs> you can just, just say it once more. <laughs> I just actually want to hear what you said. What? It's it takes place from the 21st to the 31st of May. Is that correct? Ten days. 
I can't see the show notes. And that's what it says in the they, show notes. You didn't finish your sentence. They sponsored something. They sponsored an exhibition space for First Lego League at the Process Expo. Yes. Thank you for making me finish my sentence. <laughs> Society of Automation, Instrumentation, Measurement and Control. Okay. Has sponsored a table, a, a, a area for Lego League. Uh, yes, for the first Lego League to exhibit at the Process Expo, so that they can get some some publicity. So who is the Lego League? Uh, all right. So I thought I had another picture, but the first Lego League is like a, a, a contest. You build stuff out of Lego, and then you take part in competitions. Okay, like uh, Warhammer, th those type. Of well, no, it's more like you build little robots, or y you you. There's different challenges, and then you have to build something out of Lego to enter that particular challenge. So sometimes, like in, in the U.S. and in the U.K., they have robotic competitions where mm -hmm. uh, you have to build a robot out of Lego, um, whether you use Lego Technic or just, you know, Lego and put your own motors and stuff on there. It's, it's all about, like, robotics, but it's all Lego-based. Or Raspberry Pi. Sounds, sounds very good. <laughs> yeah, you can use a Raspberry Pi. You can use a DigiSpark. Then on 21 July, the National Robotics Olympiad, NRO, takes place at TUT, the Chwani University of Technology, in Pretoria, in Pata. <laughs> the weekend after that, 28 July, 31 August, the NRO finals take place at TUT, in Pata. <laughs> if, if you were keen on, uh, if you were keen on uh, building some r robots, I think now it's too late. You basically, you, you pretty much have to lead up to this for like oh, a year. Oh yes, no. Um, taking part in the Olympiad, you have to register from the start of the year already. But if you want to go watch, it's really amazing to see what uh, what these kids come up with because it's mostly high school children who are taking part in the robotics Olympiad. Mm. Then Annie felt really passionately about this, so it's in the show notes. Free comic book day. Oh yes. Dun, I did dun, yeah. dun. <coughs> what, what is happened? Free Comic Book Day? First of all, what is it? What, what, what was is, it supposed what, to be? What, what is Free Comic Book Day? Yeah, okay. let's start there. So, uh, Free Comic Book Day is an international day. Like Speak Like a Pirate Day. <laughs> yes. Um, where comic book stores from, you know, all over the globe uh, participate, uh, publishers sponsor free comics. And then you go to your nearest comic book shop and you can get a free comic. Um, and a lot of uh, you know, places will have a whole lot of events that go with this, uh, you know, like cosplay and, and other things. And in Cape Town, Free Comic Book Day is quite a, a big affair. It's, it's celebrated. People go all out. Um, well, it's, it's, it's at fun. Reader's Den at, at the very Reader's least. Den there's like a big event. But yes, if you're in Cape Town, you would go down to Reader's Den, you would wear a costume, everything, and you'd get your free comics. So um, this being the first year that I actually get to do free comic book day, um, I decided to take a look at the places that are available around us, and we live in Centurion. And uh, we've only found, we have only have two comic shops in Centurion. No, uh, oh, in Centurion. Yeah, there's only two comic book shops in Centurion. The one was not participating in free comic book day, uh, so we went to the other and when we got there, they pretty much told us that we had to buy something before they would give us a free comic. And by the time we decided what we wanted to buy, the comics were gone. Well, there, so. there was only one type of comic left. The ones that we really wanted, the Mass Effect comic yeah. in particular, was, it was gone. It, like hotcakes. Yeah, it was when finished. We, when we arrived, there weren't very many comics. I think there were five different comics to choose from to begin with and very, a very little supply of it. But... It, it was very disappointing because you rock up there and then they first want to make you buy something before you can get your free comic. And so that was the inter interpretation of but free. But that, that's not how free comic book day is supposed it's to work. It's not supposed to work, no. So, so for me, you know, it was my very first time experiencing free comic book day. Uh, it didn't go so well and I am a sad panda. <laughs> panda. <laughs> what did you decide to buy? Um, it was a toss-up between uh, the Bioshock Infinite art book, hardcover which, which art I book. Which I was in favor of. 400 Rand, so not too bad. Mm -hmm. A lot of damage, but not too bad. Or a gift for a friend, a figurine. Um, and there were also like a bunch of other comics that looked interesting. Umbrella. Umbrella something. Yeah, Umbrella something. It's about like, it's basically X-Men, but different. <laughs> it's, it's about kids and there's a school and they get signed up into some, some sort of superhero thing. The backstory is different. They're not mutants, but it comes down to the same thing. Mm -hmm. But it looked interesting nonetheless. There were kick-ass comics. 
um, that looked, uh, or graphic novels, I should say, rather, that looked interesting. So there were a couple of options. Um, none of them Do you cheap. want to say where this was? What, which comic store? I don't remember it the name. You so cannot bad. play Ingress in the middle of the show, Johan. I'm not saying Ingress. There's a, <laughs> <laughs> a key just came through. Sorry. <laughs> It was, it was such a bad experience that I have blocked the name of the shop out of my memory. Okay, all right. Which is a nice way of saying that I can't remember. <laughs> I'm just trying to remember that because I know two comic stores shops or shops that sell comic stores in Centurion. Well, we will compare notes afterwards. Well, I'll, I'll say this. Anime Works was the one that was not participating. According to their Facebook page. Okay. Somebody was asking them on the Facebook page. But at least page. they commented it, though. They at least said, no, listen, we won't participate. Well, Jan had to go troll through a bunch of forums to find out what... Uh, okay. No, well, I had to go look on their Facebook page. I mean, that's not too hard. All right, any case. Yep, that brings us to the end of our events roundup. If, uh, if <laughs> there's something cool happening um, in and around South Africa, anywhere, whether it's from uh, Pofader or d like whether it to the blasting metropolis of Colenso. Okay, have you ever been to Pofader? No, but I've been to Colenso. I would very okay. much like to go to Pofader. I mean, Postmansburg and Pofader, South to Plaque. One is left, one is right. Trust me, there is no, nothing happening. <laughs> Whatever. If, it, if anything, <laughs> but is, if something, yeah, is happening, is happening to, the, to, to, the, to the more lively Cape Town, Johannesburg and Durban. If we miss something, let us know. We'd love to put it in Star Day to mention it in the show. Then that brings us to what geekery is this? We should totally have like a jingle play there that's like epic. You voice. almost had one. What? What? Cool. Epic voice. After King Jingle. Oh, oh yes. Baby. Oh no, I'm I'm using the I'm using that jingle as our new plane song. Oh, okay, so cool. you you guys will be hearing a new jingle when I start publishing shows. It's gonna be awesome. So check out for that. Tell, let me know what you think. First up, Finn Fisher Spyway servers in South Africa. And yeah. Telcom and Government are mum on uh, what exactly is going on there. Though to qualify that, um, I should say that okay, firstly, we didn't have the full IP addresses to begin with. Mm -hmm. I do have them now and I'm busy following up. Um, though that said, I am very, very skeptical about Telcom actually telling me who owns those servers. Because imagine like somebody, you know, there's something running on your machine and I as a journalist go to your host and go, who owns that server? And they go, oh, it belongs to Tim Hark. I mean, that's not going to happen. And I, I think that's even illegal. I'm fairly sure yeah. they're not allowed to do that. So I think the chances of me actually finding out through legitimate means... <laughs> <laughs> where these um, boxes are. Uh, when and who these boxes are. I've tried to find out if they've got a registered domain uh, to them, yeah. and I couldn't find anything. So um, No, no reverse on the IP. No, it, it seems to be hosted on the Telcom ADSL network, but that could just as well be a wholesale customer. Okay, so, so tell us what it does. Okay, so Finn Fisher, <laughs> for, those, for those of you who, who missed the story at the start of the week. I love this part. Yeah, keep going. Okay. Because I read it, and I was thinking... I had some guys moaning about the software. Yeah, so, so well. basically what it is, is it's really expensive spyware mm -hmm. that governments typically buy. Now, you get two ways typically that this gets used. It can get used for legitimate law enforcement purposes. So you can use it to find out what the mob is doing or whatever in your country. Or you can use it to spy on political dissidents. I mean, that's the thing about any tool, right? It's, it's, it's a hack. Well, not hacking tool. It's a Trojan horse. Yes. And so the way it infects your machine is a Trojan. And so now the, the one infection I found particularly interesting, the way they, they infected the machines of Bahraini dissidents, um, I think in 2011 or maybe 2012, I, I don't remember, um, is they sent a, a file that was named exe. Dot, you know, something to help you click on this file, dot .jpg. So it looked like a picture. And the email that was sent out is, hey, look at this. It's horrifying, you know, kind of thing. You know, something to get them to click, you know. And something charged. that people are going to forward to political charge people. Yeah, and, and also so that, you know, hey, you know, like this, you might want to put this on your blog or you might want to put this on Twitter or whatever the case might be. You double click it. It then uses an export in Windows in the right to left character to make it read the file name backwards. So instead of running, opening it up in a picture viewer, it runs in EXE. Boom, spyware is installed. So, um, it takes over? Ta it doesn't take over anything. What it does do is it masquerades as Firefox, amongst other things. It masquerades as other things as well, but it actually looks like Firefox. It, it's taken the, the assembly code, the header assembly code of Firefox, and it's, and it, it's duplicated that. When you right-click on the executable and you say, what, the only thing to distinguish it is the file size. It's just slightly the. This is slightly smaller than the file. Also, this is also to get past antivirus things that are yes. supposed to stop this. Yes, exactly. So this is a. They call it an evasion technique, and it's not uncommon for Viri or malware to to do yeah. this. 
<laughs> but when this when this emerged, Firefox Mo- Mozilla was not not too pleased about this, so they've um, sent a cease and desist to Gamma International, which is the company behind Finn Fisher, to say you need to stop using Firefox to yeah, hide behind. Yeah, hide behind yeah. <laughs> oh, and it's quite interesting; it's they're taking them on a copyright for it. You you basically destroying our name or oh, trademark? Yeah, yeah, like a trademark violation. Yeah, very very. <laughs> it's just like no, never mind what you're doing. I'm going to see it's that roundabout. I can't attack you directly. Well, Al Capone had to go under for yeah. tax evasion. <laughs> so you get them on what you can. Um, yeah, so this is actually quite interesting. Now, these same spyware con- command and control servers are hosted on the telecom network in South Africa. So what they're being used for, we don't know. Who's is behind just, them, we just don't a, know. A caching system out here. It could not. It might even be that they're just using it as a as a decentralized as a, system. Yeah, as a decentralized system. This could actually be to spy on people in you know Sudan or whatever that we don't know about, and they just might just collecting the data. Down might here. also just be backups for their website. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think so. No, the, the way these I mean, guys South detect Africa it, is the ultimate target for for, for low bandwidth usage. Low, yeah, yeah. No, for yeah. backup sites. I mean, that's where you do it. <laughs> uh, you host them, yeah. yeah, but you, you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yes. on the telecom network. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I the, the, the cheapest network out there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, the sarcasm is ah, strong sorry. with us tonight. But, yeah, uh, the, no, it's not going to be for anything as benevolent as a website. Typically what these guys do when they investigate spyware is they ensure that traffic from the malware actually goes to this command and control server. So they actually physically saw, you know, something, something going. going to these servers. Okay. And uh, that brings us – That actually answers – you could actually quite easily deny, yeah, don't do this. Denial of service, these servers now, now that you know the IPs. Yes. Or if but you I'm not could reverse <laughs> engineer the thing, you could start seeing them a lot of junk. Just give them too much data to analyze. I'm not, I'm not going to hand them just, I'm not going to hand them out before finding out whether I may. Um, no, don't, 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 don't. I'm just thinking if this is, because it must be practically available some way. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Hawky ZA is also making a crack about bandwidth usage because on the Telcom ADSL network, uh, as someone who's recently had to upload 200 megs of video file um, at 500 kilobits per second, I can attest to that. Trying to host a server on a Telcom ADSL connection is just not going to work. <laughs> so if you're trying to spy files. on ADSL users, it would be the best place to put it. Actually, yeah, and, 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 and now that you mentioned, hang on, it's your download speed that it's going to be using, not the up speed. It's not going to be serving content. It's going to be accepting content. So it won't be that bad. And it's going to be using... If well, depend if if it's accepting from the ADSL users, it's using their upload. Yeah, but not they but, upload, but so it's they, down. So as long as it's on ten so meg, it can service quite a couple of. So it can, yeah, it can handle yes, quite a bit. Yes. Um, then <clears throat> to talk about what I what I hinted at earlier, the fact that if you go to the effort to pay for the content you wish to consume online. So you want to download something, you want to download a movie, and you go through the effort to pay for it through a service that's not supported in your region, like Netflix and Hulu. We do have iTunes movies and stuff now, but still no series. And you go through the effort to try and pay for that, it's still illegal. This is the type of illegal it is. It is piracy. It is copyright infringement. So whether you whether you download something from a news okay. server, well, that's what I said. I read your article. Okay, this is the thing. He sort of said it's not, it's, it's, it's like not gray area. criminal. But what he did, he was more implying is that it's actually you're breaking the terms of service. It's two, of the site. No, it's you twofold. Who are you so, talking about? You're saying he? It's uh, a lawyer. lawyer I I consulted. His name is Nicholas Hall from South Microsoft's Af- attorneys. Oh, South African lawyer. South African lawyer. So from a South African crim- criminal, what? From a technology lawyer. Yes. Court, it is illegal. Yes. And uh, it's not, I mean, nobody's obviously tested this in our courts because seriously, I'm sure the magistrate would kick you out because he's got better things to do than to handle uh, copyright infringement cases. But uh, well, somebody will need to lobby the action against you. So, mm. so he said that it's, who, who it's not Africa? criminal, but it's actionable. And he said the people who might take action, he says, because the, the mm. copyright holders it will probably be only too happy that at least you're trying to pay. Yes. Right, as long as they're getting the money, they, yeah. they don't mind. The people who might action is somebody like Multi Choice, somebody, or, you know, or even Stokinical, somebody who owns the online distribution rights. He didn't mention Stokinical; he specifically mentioned Multi Choice, mm-hmm. but somebody who owns the the online distribution rights to this content, who then now is um, removed the ability to sell it to you, 
Yeah, but my question is, would they attack us or would they attack Netflix for prevent, not preventing us? No, but I mean, what are they going to do to Netflix? Netflix is not going to go. Netflix is going to go, listen, these guys are going through. I mean, it's like going through. What are you going to do about a VPN? There's nothing they yeah, can physically I, I, do about I know, a VPN. But, and, and you're going through extreme links like Hulu Plus, for example. You can't just give them a South African credit card. You have to go through – you have to register – try to register something through Entropay is a, is a virtual credit card system. They don't just take that. You've got to then go through PayPal, but then you've got to verify – because PayPal also like really doesn't like Entropay cards. So first you have to prove to them that you're not some sort of scammer slash mm. you know, criminal of some kind to get it to work. I still haven't got it working, to be completely honest. I tried to sign up for Hulu Plus using this method and it didn't work my, and my other question is let's say you following this logic if you're an American who's paid for it in America and you come yes, out here and yes. watch it you're illegal exactly well, you, okay, exactly just, mundo. Just, just on, the, the record, on the nail doesn't work you actually they don't stream into these regions so even if you are American that come out here and want to watch it. Spotify. Spotify does, but no one else does. So Spotify gives you a specific account. Uh, you, like if you pay for the premium account, then you're allowed to use it in other regions. And yes. then there's some sort of content agreement, but that's just music. So as soon as you deal with things like films and series, like all the wheels come off. Like the distribution deals to handle that sort of thing. It's just a quagmire. It's crazy. So, um, and so that brings me to an interesting comment I saw on the My Broadband Forum. I actually, uh, or in the comment section, I actually wanted to get a screenshot to put it on screen, but I completely forgot. My apologies. Um, somebody's saying that, you know, it's actually the, the Film and Publications Board. And while they might be a factor, um, somebody replied to that person and explained it. Uh, relatively well and, and said that it's, it's really about the content distribution deals. It's about the fact that um, if you want to sell or, or rent or whatever certain movies in South Africa, you have to go through Stokinico or, or maybe this, even New Metro. Yeah. Yeah, it's, a it's also got to do with exclusivity deals. So the content producers, HBO, Fox, whoever, they might get a better deal selling it exclusively to DSTV to multi-choice because multi-choice is willing to pay a premium for that exclusivity. Multi-choice also has an online distribution mechanism. Which then allows them to charge a very good markup on to sell it to us. Um, sure, because they've got no competition, right? So, um, but that, but they, the thing is they pay top dollar for that exclusivity. It's interesting. Could you take them to competition commission? No, because the, they, they, it's not that they don't have any competition uh, because top TV is there, right? No, but let's say if they have a specific deal, so clinical, right, to get that specific movie. Who else can you buy from? You see, the thing is, by the time you've gone through the whole com that board, the the exclusivity on that specific. Oh, no, movie no, but you don't go. Has, oh, you, you, you go. You go on oh, that the fact that they they the only people can sell no. these. It is interesting, and that has happened elsewhere in Africa, um, where uh, multi choice or or another player is dominant, and there's a new player from China. The people who are trying who are buying up top TV start yeah. times, where they are fighting these types of exclusivity deals. Like for example, multi choice has pretty much tied up all the sport. All the South African sport, all the sport we care about. They've mm -hmm. tied that up. And so to try and break open the market, you have to haul them in front of a you competition see, tribunal. I can tell you now they're going to lose that one. Maybe. They paid for it. Yeah, they but were it's, at it's, open it, bid and they put up their hand and said, we'll give you so much. Yeah, it's about money. But, but Star Times now hopefully has the dosh to be able so to fight that. So they just got to wait for those contracts yeah. to lapse. But multi-choice then, then and, and quite rightly, multi-choice would actually say then when people are like, why are the price is going up? They'd say, we had to pay double what we did last year for Supersport because suddenly people are competing in the bidding. So but it, I don't it's understand is why it has to go to just one person. Yeah. Why? Because they're willing to pay for it. So for but, but let's follow from this. Then Telcom is willing to pay to get the license to be the only telecom provider in this country. Let's do that. Um, but that is slightly different because the license to become a telco is not going to a profit generating organization is going to government. So, I, I mean, I understand what you're trying to yeah, say. Yeah, it's, it's of a similar nature is more what I'm saying. It, yeah, it's, I, yeah. But this is I just still believe, content. Seeing it, you're bringing it up on sport. The only guy that can stop this is the minister of sport. He's who, the one that got to get be, up and yeah. goes, He has to say, it's no, not No, well, actually, on the minister of sport. It would have to be government of, uh, in some way. Driven well, by the minister of well, sport. Well, uh, uh, it can be the minister of sport, communications. Pick a minister. Pick a minister. There has to be political will is what yeah. it comes down to. But I don't want to get – anyway, anyway, so There have also been some other arguments that were made in the, in the forums that say that multi-choice's argument doesn't make much sense. Um, this is math, Massothy. He says, it's like saying that importing a book from Amazon is illegal because you didn't buy it from Kalahari or their business partners. Well, the thing that multi-choice said was the business model is standard. And that's not false. 
The fact is, is that elsewhere in the world, people pay for exclusivity on deals. HBO, by the way, so, so to not just say that multi-choice said, um, this is something I didn't mention explicitly in the article, but if you go, I mean, Game of Thrones has become a, a massive example of what happens when content isn't made available on on reasonable people just, bases, yeah. people just pirate it. If you go to a certain torrent site uh, whose name starts with a K-A-T and ends with a P-H, then you'll see a cloud, um, uh, a tag cloud. Game of Thrones is the biggest tag in that cloud. Um, this is the kind of stuff I do in the office for research. It's fantastic. Um, and, and so people are like, why don't you just make it available on reasonable terms through HBO Go. You have an online platform for distributing this. Just let people subscribe to HBO Go. And so HBO is cool. They do a survey. What are you willing to pay for HBO Go? And people said, you know, um, there's some people were willing to pay $15. Some were willing to pay less than that. And there were also higher options. But the majority of the people were not willing to pay enough to make it worth HBO's while. It is still more profitable for them to sell it to a cable provider, to sell it to someone like MultiChoice, than it is to sell directly to the public. And exclude Online. the cable provider. Because that's generally, I actually saw the article you're talking about. And it's the thing is, with the, if they did it online, they'd lose that cable provider. Yes, exactly. So if they, do it just, if they do it online, then the cable provider would be like, hang on, you, the content owner, is now competing against me, the content distributor, GTFO. It's kind of like what people are, you know, with the whole Microsoft Surface situation where the manufacturers are going, hang on, you're making hardware now. You're effectively, you, platform maker, are competing against me, hardware maker. That's ridiculous. People get angry about these things. Mm. Anyway, that said, that brings us to the end of What Geekery Is This? However, we have a positive note to end the show on. This is a, a very cute little video called Duet, or Leaves, uh, Duet of Leaves and Turntable. And what this guy did was he bought himself a turntable because he wanted to, uh, you know, listen to records. and, and uh, Old vinyl records. Yes, and yeah, old vinyl record turntable. And um, he... Uh, it, it turned out, um, but it didn't turn out as he was expecting it would. Um, so what he, what he then did was to try and, you know, just have it do something is he would pick various types of leaves, put a microphone on his fingertip, and then put the leaf on the turntable and generate a sound, record it with the microphone to somewhere. And then, and he made a, a very interesting sounding song, an actual song with it. He, he got tones and beats uh, using just leaves on a turntable. Very interesting. Did, so did he in any way notes. mix or alter the sounds? Um, he, um, he may have, um, but uh, I don't, th he, I don't, th he didn't mention anything. I don't think he did. <laughs> so he doesn't mention the fact that he altered the sounds. He so didn't auto tune the trees. <laughs> That's the question. <laughs> I, I must, I must, must read, that read one, yeah. um, fr from the ROC, leave him alone. Well done, Mickey D. Mickey D, well done. <laughs> With that, we're going to end the show on that awesome pun. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, you guys. Uh, we'll see you again uh, next week. You can uh, follow us on Twitter at Let's Talk Geek. You can circle us on Google Plus, LT Network or Let's Talk Network. One of those two. You'll find us. Um, uh, I have no idea yeah. anymore. And if, you, on... if you want to watch our videos, that's on LT Star Network on YouTube. And if you but want if you, the audio if podcast, you search for Let's Talk Geek, you should find them. Yeah. And if you want to check out our audio podcast, you can go to our website, ltg.letstalknetwork.tv, correct? Yeah. ltg.letstalknetwork.tv will actually for, re bounce you to ltg.ltnet.tv. Okay, cool. So we've got like the shortened domain and we're trying to just make everything. But run if you properly. go to the long one, it, it will just, you'll just magically arrive where you need to be. Cool, cool. Thank you so much to my co-hosts, Tim Hark. Where can people find you? Uh, not many. Uh, <laughs> not Tim anywhere. underscore here. Hark. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> online. <laughs> On Wednesdays. Be here. Be square. <laughs> Johan else. Where can people find you? <laughs> right now. Find me in Ingress. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> Triple W dot who dash else. That's Can't take um, you anywhere, dude. I'm also Johan else. Uh, who else in Ingress? Uh, Enlightenment team. Gauteng region. Uh, Enlightenment or nothing. Annie from Yellen, where can people find you? Uh, right here, I suppose. Uh, I am at AnnieBugZA uh, on Twitter. And uh, hopefully someday soon someone will make me a... <laughs> we can teach you how to use Inkscape, and then you can do it yourself. Teach a man to fish and all that. How boring. How boring. <laughs> uh, oh, Tim's Just doing for it. you. Tim is doing it. I will start now. I won't have it finished for the end of the show. <laughs> but it's like one minute after the end of the show. 
I'm Jan Vermeulen. I am the staff writer at mybroadband.co.za. I'm also on Twitter at JanVZA.